Hello human beings, thank you so much for clicking on this video. So it has been a long time since I've made a sit down video like this. Your girl has just really been on her vlog game. Like I've really been living it up now that I'm back in California. But I thought I'd go ahead and switch up the content a little bit. And I've really missed making these kind of videos because I feel like they could actually offer some sort of help or like friendly advice for those of you guys who are also interested in moving to Japan yourselves. I moved to Tokyo in late 2018 and moved back very recently in December of 2021. So it has been a couple of months now since I moved and my life in Tokyo almost feels like this weird fever dream. Like I still can't believe I did that. <laughs> but moving there was hands down the best decision I've ever made in my life. And to anyone who's ever even like a little bit curious about moving to Japan, I always, always advise to just do it because it is totally possible. Like all of my other friends who are also foreigners, if we were just regular degular people who are able to make that leap, any of you guys can do it too. But full disclaimer, I know that at the time that I'm recording this, I think there's a lot of restrictions for going into Japan currently. So just make sure to do your own research so you can plan accordingly. So I have already made a lot of videos discussing life in Japan. I made videos about like the pros and cons of living in Japan, the kind of culture shock that I faced, how much money I saved up in order to even move there. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and make a whole playlist of all those Japan videos and include this one in there in case you you guys want to use that as a reference because to this day I still get so many questions about living in Japan and how to go there. I think the number one question that I do get is about the visa process but unfortunately I cannot help in that arena. So my mother is Japanese so I actually went through the process of getting a Japanese passport and that's how I was able to live in Japan. But the next questions that I get all the time are about finding work and housing and that is something I can help you with because I have a lot of experience in that. I mean, after all, if you want to make it in Japan, you're going to need a paycheck and a roof over your head, right? So in my three years of living in Tokyo, I had three different jobs and I lived in... Okay, wow, I lived in four different housing situations. <sighs> That's rough, buddy. My first girlfriend turned into the moon. That's rough, buddy. So anyway, first, why don't we dive into how you can find work in Japan? So the number one resource that I personally use when I was looking for work in Japan is this website called Gaijin Pot. Um, this is not sponsored, by the way. They have no idea I exist, <laughs> but they always have updated job listings. They have a really nice, easy to follow website layout. Everything is in English. So I think it's really user friendly for foreigners. So I'm going to get out my laptop and share my screen with you guys so you can follow along. But by the way, every resource I'm going to be sharing with you guys today is coming completely free. Actually, I have a lot of friends who hired recruiters to help them find work and they had amazing experiences with that. I personally never did that. So I'm just gonna show you the free stuff that I use. <laughs> Your girl is trying to save coin in every area she can and I had great success with that. Okay, so I should be sharing my screen with you guys now. So this website is Gaijin Pot right over here. So let me show you guys what the page looks like. So here's the main page of Gaijin Pot. They have a lot of different resources as you could see up here. So let's go up to the left and it should be the very first tab right here. All right, so now we can scroll down and you see here we have job search, keywords, all roles, and locations. And down here we have some other options that you guys can work with. So they have options for like full-time work or part-time, remote work okay, non-teaching jobs if that's what you're looking for because let's be honest the easiest job to find in japan as an english speaker is probably to be an english teacher so let me just show you guys the basics so here in keywords let's just say that we want to go into some kind of creative work and i don't really use all roles but if you find that to be helpful that is an option for you and for locations let's just say that we live where i lived and that is tokyo so now let's hit search and it'll start to show you what kind of options we have. So that's pretty good. There's 20 options for creative work. So here's all the jobs you can see. They'll have the date of when the job was posted, the company, salary, location, and the Japanese level. You can filter out jobs that don't require any Japanese at all. But for most jobs, they might want even like business level or conversational. Obviously, the higher level your Japanese is, you're going to have more options. If you want to find a job that requires no Japanese at all, it's 
probably going to be some sort of language teaching job. So let's just say, for example, this is the job that you're interested. We can go ahead and click and it'll bring us into this main page. So it has the basic information right up here and it also has the requirements. So this job, for example, does require you to be fluent in Japanese and have business level English. Amos currently reside in Japan. That's another thing I forgot to mention. Japanese companies are a lot more traditional, even though I know a lot of jobs are moving more towards remote work right now. At least when I was looking for jobs three years ago, a lot of the requirements for jobs is that they want you to already be residing in Japan. So I was applying to a lot of jobs before I even moved, but none of the companies got back to me. It wasn't until I actually moved to Japan, I started to get interviews. I'm not sure what the climate is like now because obviously a lot of things have changed in three years, but that's just something to look out for. So the great thing about Gaijingpot is that if you log in and create an account, you can directly upload your resume into Gaijingpot. So whenever you want to apply to any of the job listings that you see here, you just log in and your resume is already there. You just write a cover letter and it's quite simple and easy to follow. I'm back on the homepage because I wanted to show you guys this option right here. This is no Nihongo, which means no Japanese. So if you literally have zero Japanese ability, these are the jobs that are available to you. They actually have quite a lot. They have 71 job listings, but as we're looking, I already see that, yeah, a lot of these are going to be teaching jobs. Okay, so the next resource or website that I wanna show you guys is Jobs in Japan. This is another one that I found to be really easy to use, really straightforward, and they have a lot of good job listings. So same kind of layout. You just wanna type in your keywords, job category, job location. Also has these options for like full-time, part-time, visa offered, oh, that's a great one. And no Nihongo, overseas, okay. So let's just put in media for keywords. And I will also go ahead and put Tokyo for job location. So these are the jobs that showed up. And what I like over here is that you can go ahead and refine your categories a little bit more if you'd like to. So you could go ahead and put in here, like native English level, Japanese level, Let's just say you have conversational, like me. <laughs> of course, if you're a really high skilled worker, a lot of Japanese companies are now on LinkedIn or indeed.com. So there's a lot of job listings on there. It is really highly saturated though. So I had a lot more luck using these websites like Gaijin Pot and Jobs in Japan. Another one, funnily enough, that I had a lot of luck with was Craigslist. <laughs> and I was so surprised to see that there was a lot of different kinds of jobs on there. So I was able to get actually a couple of interviews from Craigslist. <laughs> I was personally really intimidated going into job interviews in Japan because that was my first time like really interviewing for like my big girl jobs. Japan has a really different kind of etiquette when it comes to interviews. And another thing that freaked me out was I could not get my nose ring out and I was so scared. But um, most of the companies I applied for, they're really foreigner friendly. So I actually had a really great experience doing interviews. I think it also just depends on what kind of job and company you're going for. If you're gonna go for a really traditional Japanese company, boo boo, like you gotta get your etiquette straight, okay? You gotta get the outfit. There's really specific types of clothes that you have to wear. You have to have your keigo down, which is like the very formal way of speaking. So yeah, I never did that personally. <laughs> Okay, so now why don't we go ahead and talk about how to find housing. So when I first came to Japan, like I said, I was a fresh college graduate. I was trying to save that coin. So the best economical choice for me personally was to live in a share house. So as you can refer from the name, a share house is a living space that you share amongst other people. The very first share house I lived in, I think there were 11 rooms in that one. And the second share house that I moved into, I only shared with three other people. So it really depends. But I really recommend share houses when you initially move to Japan because they're month to month. You don't have to make like a year long or two year uh, commitment like most Japanese apartments. You also get to live with other roommates, which I know has its pros and cons, but especially when you move to a new country for the first time, it might be nice to live with other people in the same boat as you, or there's usually Japanese people living there too. So it's really nice to immerse yourself in the culture with Japanese people and live with them. Also share houses are a lot cheaper than living in an apartment. Everything's already furnished, so you don't have to worry about that. There's a lot of foreigner friendly ones as well. So I just typed in share house in Tokyo 
and you can see all of these ones that popped up. So actually the first one right here is one that I personally used when I was living in Japan. This is Fontana. I really liked this company. I lived in their share house for I think a year and a half. They were always so helpful. The customer service was amazing. I really liked the house I was living in and they have really great locations too. So if you live in like Shinjuku-ku or Shibuya, Harajuku, Meguro, like those are really, you know, popping parts of Tokyo. So those are gonna be more expensive. So up to you, but let's just go ahead and do property type. They do have apartments. They have furnished apartments that are a little more expensive, but just for the sake of this video, let's type in guest room and you can even type in the availability. So if you already know when you're coming to Japan and know your dates, you can put that in here, but I'm just gonna leave it open and search what rooms they have available right now or coming up. They have all the different room listings. They have the price for each room. They have the location and which train line they're on and the size of the room. So as you can see from the pictures, they're nothing fancy, but I personally found them to be quite affordable. So here's some pictures of just a really basic room that they have. And they even have the layout of the share house so you could see like how many rooms are in there, where the toilet is located, where the kitchen is. But say you refuse to live in a guest house, you could also go into apartments here and these are already furnished. Let's just click on this first one that's available now. Very typical small Japanese apartment. It's essentially just one room, just like I suspected. Ah, this brings back some memories and a very, very tiny Japanese kitchen in the hallway <laughs> and this tiny little unit bath. I really didn't like unit baths in Japan, but you know what? Housing is way cheaper in Tokyo than it is in most American cities, so I cannot complain. But yeah, this is only 17 square meters, and that's how tiny the little apartment is. Very compact. But also, if you're just specifically looking for apartments, Gaijin Pot, uh, the website that we were looking at for jobs, they actually have a tab here that's apartments. I absolutely love this website. I actually found my very last apartment that I was living in with my partner through Gaijin Pot Apartments. So we'll scroll down here into Refine Search. I found this to be so helpful. So let's go ahead and click Tokyo. And over here, you can click which area that you're specifically looking for, or you could even choose your train line, which I thought was so helpful, especially if you already have a job and you know where your office is, or you have somewhere that you go to really frequently, you can specifically narrow your search to apartments that only show up on your train line. So let's just say, for example, we live on the Chuo line, which is a very, very popular train line in Tokyo. And you could even narrow down to which station you want, but let's just keep it open and do all stations. A max monthly cost, say you don't want to go over 80,000 yen. For your apartment, you can even choose the minimum layout. So this is kind of confusing for people. I know I was confused when I was first looking for apartments. So the one stands for how many rooms. So a one R is a one room. So that would essentially be like a studio or we could go down to one K, which is one room with a kitchen attached. One DK means one room with a dining room and a kitchen. And the most sought after I think is a LDK. That's a living room, dining room and kitchen. For example, the last apartment that I lived in with my partner was a two DK which stands for two bedroom with a dining and a kitchen. We just converted the dining room into a living room. So let's just say you're a single person looking for a one bedroom with a dining and a kitchen. You can even choose distance from the station. Say you want your apartment to be no more than a seven minute walk to the nearest station. You can narrow that search down. They have a couple more down here like furnished, internet, no deposit, all that good stuff. But let's just search and see what shows up. They have the monthly cost when it's available, the size, Wow, this one's like 53 square meters. Which floor? the year it's built and it tells you where the nearest station is. Unfortunately, this one is a six minute walk to the nearest bus stop and then a 25 minute bus to Takao station. Make sure to look for that because sometimes it is a little bit deceiving because you might just think, oh, it's a six minute walk to the station. Like, no, no, no. You're gonna have to take a 25 minute bus ride until you get to the station. So that's why the rent is so cheap. But yeah, we could just click on this one, for example, and it'll just show you some pictures, show you the layout. This one doesn't have many images, but you get the gist. And if you're interested on the left side over here, you can just type in your name, email, phone, and you can send them a message and usually they will call you back. All right, so I hope I was able to cover everything for you guys. I hope you guys now have a better understanding of how to find work or housing here in Japan. It's really quite simple once you actually look through it. So once again, I'll link a playlist down below if you wanna binge any more of my Japan videos. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully see you next time. Bye-bye.